Tim McInerney, the town administrator of the town of Grafton. You may know me, you may not. But we're here tonight to talk about one thing regarding the old DPW site on Upton Street. So we hired a group that's gonna keep us focused and help to get us organized to figure out how best to serve the needs of the community relative to this site. The DPW facility that's being built on Westboro Road is nearly complete and they should be vacating this site in early summer, leaving this site available as a gateway into the common, into the town of Grafton. Pretty important, been a terrible eyesore for a very long time. You may not agree with that, but I'm gonna say it. Uh, we need to do better, we can do better, but we need community input to do it and to do it right, which may end up moving us towards a zone change because right now it's R40. So before I go any further with any more discussion, I thank you all for coming out. We have uh, the state of Massachusetts through Mass Development. We have a technical assistance grant that we applied for and we received, which we're extremely grateful for. That's providing technical assistance money necessary to do the study and to do these type of focus groups and conceptual drawings that you'll see tonight. We have the consultant, Horsley Whitney, which I might have ruined that name. I could just turn around and read it. Uh, and Mass Development here that will uh, guide us through a process of like a charrette that we do a lot of times in this community to identify needs and possible solutions for those needs. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nathan to walk us through um, the conceptual designs that you see up here and they'll take us through a formatted program to get us to the highest and best use for the site. Does anybody have any questions before I hand the microphone over? Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Tim. So again, my name is Nate Kelly, and I work with the consulting firm, the Horsley Witten Group. Uh, one thing I wanna say before we start is, um, after my presentation, I'll ask you guys if you have any questions, and, and there'll be a moment where we can have a little bit of discussion if you wanna do that before you go to the boards, which is our primary exercise tonight. If we do have any Q&A after this, um, you'll need to use microphones. So this is being recorded, and there isn't sort of an ambient microphone that's recording everything. So at that moment, uh, we have more mics, and we can run a mic over to you um, if you need to say something. So. That's, I guess that's our ground rule for tonight. So as Tim said, we are looking uh, primarily thinking about the redevelopment opportunity of the DPW site, but it's important obviously to think about this in the context of this pretty amazing neighborhood. I mean, all, all, off to the west, the common, Apple Tree Arts where we are right now, the churches, the library, the historic center um, of this area, the community, is a pretty amazing resource. And so when you, and you look to the north, to Norcross Park, you have institutional uses with the post office and the fire department. This particular site, this location, um, really represents an opportunity not just for the land, that we're talking about, but really for this entire district, for this entire neighborhood. So as we started to think about this project, we were sort of thinking at that scale in terms of what could we add that would add value to this area and maybe also provide some amenities or some connections, um, strengthen some connections that don't exist today. Looking more closely, um, we just wanted to zoom in here just to give everybody a sense of the site itself and again how it sits across from the fire department where the post office, there's a multifamily uh, housing unit right up above the word Upton on Upton Street. Uh, there's the barn structure off to the left there, the white barn structure which is basically kind of a, an ad hoc storage unit right now for the, for the town. But it's just interesting to see this yellow outline shows the land that is under municipal control. So this is really what we're talking about. It's a very odd shaped parcel, um, but it does present, because of that, present some opportunities that sort of a typical sort of box rectangle um, wouldn't necessarily create. So we've been thinking about some of the opportunities and challenges associated with this site. Oops. 
Um, I talked about the proximity to the center and the proximity to other landmarks. There is limited transit service in this area, so folks who come here or visit or need to get someplace will have um, access to some limited bus service. The T-stop is like three miles away, I believe. Uh, we talked about the size and the geometry of the lot. We've got about seven acres of land here, which is, you know, again, for a traditional village setting, that's a lot of land. You know, out in the outskirts, seven acres doesn't get you much, but as you get into these more sort of village scale centers, a lot can be done with seven acres of land. And the town has control. This is a very, truly uh, unique opportunity when the town is, you know, sort of sitting on the ownership of this, has control, and because of that can really um, leverage a lot more influence over the future of this property. In other instances, if this was already owned by a, a private property owner, you could have discussions about zoning and you could have negotiations, um, but you wouldn't really have the same level of control as you do with this if you're thinking about eventually maybe selling this to somebody with a vision intact, very prescriptive. The challenges that this area faces, um, just generally speaking relative to the market, I mean people sort of have a sense of this in, in the way things are changing even globally right now with retail and office. It's a very different market landscape than it was even 20 years ago. And so the idea of having a suburban, small suburban office park um, really doesn't have the legs that it used to. The idea of having um, simply a, a sort of a major boutique retail concept by itself is a lot more difficult to pull off in the suburban environment. On the other end of it, the housing market is extremely strong. It's almost something that you have to push against sometimes uh, because there is so much demand for different types of housing, particularly in suburban communities um, where there may not be the same amount of stock for say rental or smaller ownership units than you have in an urban setting. The traffic here, to sort of add to this idea of market and traffic and consumers, um, isn't particularly uh, busy. I mean, some of you may say, oh, you, you know, that's crazy. There's all kinds of cars. Of course there's traffic here. Um, but again, when you think about the other major arterial roads um, in this region or within the 495 belt and that type of thing, those um, similar sort of village center type areas may see 22, 25,000 cars a day. And of course, a lot of that is during the peak commute hours. But here, you're dealing with about half of that amount of traffic. So there's not the same sort of captive audience audience, if you're a developer, again, thinking about retail, um, that's going to figure into your equation. The site condition, um, is there cleanup required? This has been fairly intensive use, uh, a lot of trucks, um, a lot of sort of petroleum products and sand and salt and things like that. How much cleanup is required? We haven't answered that question yet, but that work is in progress. So for those of you who, who know a little bit about environmental work, as they call it, a phase one has been done in the sense that the history of the property has been documented and have a sense of what could be there. And now a phase two is in the works right now. And that's when you go out, you dig some holes, you, you test the groundwater, and you really get a sense of what may or may not be um, uh, in that area. I will say that the phase one um, results were not particularly alarming. Um, so hopefully that's a continual trend and the phase two comes up with, you know, not a lot of cleanup required. Depth to groundwater. So that's the distance between the surface and where there's water underneath there. And it's gonna be fairly shallow on this site. We'll talk about wetlands and how this site sort of sits in, in the middle of a, of, a old wet, of, a, of a historic wetland complex. Um, so that makes, that presents some challenges when it comes to redeveloping a property. And then there's an invasive plant species issue as well. So there are um, stands of, come on. Phragmites in this area. So, this is a shot. Ooh, this is a shot of the top area. You can see the DPW facility off to your right. And on the residential property, you can see the folks who have been living there have been fighting off this stand of Phragmites. Tall, six, seven foot tall, eight foot tall grass. 
um, that spreads like wildfire. And across the street, you see it next to the fire station as well. So very well established, moves very quickly. Um, and the reason that, again, this is important in the context of this site is these light green patches around the fire station and around the old TPW area, these are wetlands. And so if you are going to be doing any type of disturbance around that area, if you're gonna be pulling up any pavement in the DBW area, if you're not careful, if you don't do this right, it's gonna be occupied by that Phragmites almost immediately. Um, so again, it's just something to think about in terms of the context. You don't wanna give that plant any new opportunities to expand into the healthy wetlands um, around the area or to expand onto the site when you redevelop. And those white ovals there are where the stands of Phragmites are today. There was a survey done um, online and we got about 115 responses, I think, asking people, you know, just very generally, what do you think the best uses might be for the site? And you can look at this, you know, I don't want you to absorb all this right now, but the takeaway here is from the 115 people who responded, um, the majority of them weren't really excited about the idea of housing. Um, they were much more excited about the idea of sort of mixed use retail office type thing. Um, parks and Recreation also scored uh, fairly high on the interest level, and light industrial or government use, not particularly interesting to those folks. So again, it's 115 people, it's not necessarily representative of the whole com uh, community, but it's part of the conversation that we're continuing tonight, and this is a sort of a sample of what uh, people were thinking. So what we wanted to do is give you an opportunity to be a little bit more visual with this. Um, some of you probably took that survey and maybe you can take a look at these posters that we've developed for you and think about different concepts and give us your feedback on those. And so I'll walk you through these different concepts. The first idea sort of on one end of the spectrum is this open space and eco restoration. And in this particular scenario, the town keeps the parcel, doesn't sell it off, doesn't move it to another uh, owner, keeps the parcel, completely removes the DPW facility in the yard and restores the wetlands um, to, to that site. So the Phragmites are managed, this site becomes an open space wetland park, and you can see a network of trails that would connect um, over behind the post office, up to the ball field, out to the street, and would be part of a larger, you see this, da this dashed purple line, this becomes kind of a sort of a circulation loop where people can sort of enter into this area from any point, either following a sidewalk or walking through the ball field or walking through the wetland area and really have sort of a nice sort of self-contained experience here, lots of open space. So some of the, this is, so some of the things that you might think about in this concept up at the top, this is sort of the level of uh, management that you need to deal with when you're dealing with Phragmites removal. So people working with herbicides, people working with backhoes, this is aggressive stuff um, that has to happen in order to manage that species. Uh, but on the back end of that, you can have perhaps a restored wetland with walkways through it, educational kiosks, people can you know, sort of connect um, in a natural wild environment. So the pros to this, of course, is a major environmental benefit, and the community in many has public space and green infrastructure, um, places that will clean stormwater runoff and hold floodwaters. Um, the cons on this is this is a very expensive solution for the community. So this is there's no developer money coming in here. There's no sale of the property. There's an investment. You probably have to try to get some kind of grant money um, to make this happen. It's a two to three year effort just to get the Phragmites under control. And once all is said and done, there's no hard fiscal return. You're not getting tax dollars. Um, out of this uh, from some sort of a new use and a new owner. So on the, on the environmental end, very big plus. On the financial fiscal end, um, not a plus at all, a minus. Another sort of lower impact uh, solution or approach 
uh, we're calling just sort of small-scale commercial. So in here, you still see the, uh, the purple loop um, that would sort of theoretically bring people around and have different access. And the, the development, redevelopment, is concentrated right up on Upton Street. Small-scale, single-story, one-and-a-half-story buildings, uh, very much in character with a lot of the buildings and architecture that you have in the community already. The existing buildings could stay in place. Small development can go in between buildings. And then behind on the DPW site, you know, again, that would be managed and turned back into some sort of open space amenity. Um, so really not a huge uh, change to the area, um, but you know, additional uh, development there and activity um, and something that could present some nice opportunities and shops for the community. Um, so these are the types of buildings um, that we see, whether they're historic and reused or whether they're brand new and made to sort of fit again with that historic New England architecture. These are different examples of sort of small scale, single use commercial buildings just to give you a feel for, for what that concept is trying to illustrate. So there could be some environmental benefit here because that back end of the um, DPW site would be something that would have uh, re restoration and would be, uh, be an open space. So it has that community amenity to it. And then there's gonna be some revenue here from sales and tax. That property gets to be sold. Uh, negotiation occurs between the town and a private developer. And then over time, as these buildings get developed, tax uh, revenue starts coming in. So you have sort of a fiscal positive uh, scenario here with this. Um, the cons to this is that you know, we're not necessarily thinking very big here. This isn't really a gateway project per se. This is um, some light commercial that adds to the area, um, but doesn't necessarily sort of announce uh, as you're driving into this area or as you're coming to visit, doesn't create a destination that this is, you know, you're heading into something special here um, in this historic center of Grafton. A different approach um, is to think more on the housing side of this. Um, so a series of clusters of housing, whether it be senior housing, or whether it be mixed housing for you know, a market rate uh, for seniors. Um, but this particular uh, concept shows the majority of the DPW site being developed, sort of right up to where the, the wetland edges are. Um, you still connect that trailhead up to Nor Norcross Park, and there's a connection through the wetlands over to the post office, um, and a new public green has been developed in between the post office and the white barn structure, and maybe some housing is put on the back of that green um, to, again, add some smaller units to this area. Um, so again, and then some smaller houses up front on, on Upton Street. So this is the kind of sort of you know, housing that we're seeing being built, new construction in these areas where you're having quadplexes or uh, multiplex units um, that are really scaled down. And the architecture, um, again, is meant to be consistent with that traditional New England feel. Um, but you have units, like for example, on the ground here, um, the green and the red, those are four units in each of those homes. So that's eight units of housing in those two structures there. In the upper left with the blue, um, that has eight units of housing in it. And so these townhouse units, you know, again, three, four uh, per structure. This has kind of sort of been, um, again, uh, I don't want to call it a trend, but this is the latest sort of, this is how architecture is developing um, to meet this need for smaller units, whether they be rental or whether they be um, ownership. The pros here, not as much environmental benefit because you're using the majority of that site, although you could still have some of the restoration with the Phragmites issues. Um, you are helping to meet local housing demand, um, so you're providing some choices uh, for folks who maybe want to downsize 
or folks who um, need rental opportunities in a suburban area like Grafton. Um, first time home buyers could also have an opportunity to enter the market with units like these. And you're gonna get some revenue um, from sale and taxes. You know, there's a lot of talk in the work that we do where people get really worried about housing and they immediately consider this sort of multi-unit housing to be a fiscal negative. Um, and study after study shows that that is just not the case. Um, they equate multifamily housing with um, enormous increases in school population. Um, that's not happening. Kid, people are having fewer kids. The folks who are occupying um, these homes generally don't have kids or have very, very few kids. Um, so these multi-unit housings really are becoming a fiscal positive um, for uh, communities. On the cons level, it's not a destination, of course, unless you live there at your home. Um, but if you're a visitor, this isn't going to be something that you're sort of looking to go visit unless you maybe know somebody there. And then there's a more limited public space attribute uh, to, this, to this particular concept. The final one that we're looking at is this idea of a mixed-use concept. Um, so this is probably <clears throat> the, the most highly developed concept. Um, the, the green area is basically the same as what you saw in the, um, that small public green uh, next to the post office is basically the same concept. Um, but that could be a mixed-use building instead of just townhouses or something like that. Um, there would still be some small infill up on the streets. Uh, but the biggest opportunity would be on the DPW, the, the main portion of the DPW site, where you could have a cluster of buildings um, that really optimizes the space there and includes a mix of ground floor commercial um, with residential on top, um, perhaps some exclusive residential in the back, depending on what the market will yield, what the market will support. Um, but these are the types of, of buildings that, you know, again, we're talking about in terms of scale. So things that are two to three stories tall, um, have that sort of traditional feel of New England architecture to it, use classic materials, whether it's brick or clabbered or shingle, um, and again, just make a situation where you have small units of either rental or ownership uh, housing on top and office and retail uh, flexible use on the bottom. There's a mistake on this slide that my friend, my new friend Morgan pointed out to me, but I'll go through it anyway. Uh, the pros, limited environmental benefit, again, because we're using the, the, the majority of the site, so we're not getting that sort of same level of restoration. Could still take care of the Phragmites. Um, this will help to meet the local housing demand because you still are providing uh, housing alternatives that aren't maybe as common in Grafton or surrounding communities. This will provide the highest revenue from tax and sales uh, because the pro forma on this for the developer is just gonna be better. So the developer um, would, may be willing to pay a little bit more for the site, for control of the site. And then once it's built out, the tax revenue is gonna be its highest. Um, and it's gonna combine commerce so it will have that sense of destination to it and with housing, so it sort of makes it kind of a neighborhood as well. So kind of a community plus there. My mistake here is that it says not a destination, copy paste my apologies, because this is a destination, um, but there is more limited public space here. Um, so this doesn't have that sort of same, when you look at the earlier concepts, that sort of same level of open space, public area, whether it be across the site or in the rear. So tonight is our open house, and what we want you to do, um, I noticed a lot of you got here uh, early uh, to, to register, which is great, and you've had a chance to look at the boards. Um, the images that I showed you, the houses and the mixed use, they're available in these packets. So if, you want, if that's gonna help you think about this, just pick up one of these little packets on the table. Um, there'll be staff at the boards and they'll help answer questions and I'll be going back and forth and answering questions as well. So talk with the team and please leave comments. We want you to put the, the dots on what you like. So a green dot, I think this is great. A yellow dot, I think this could be good but I'm not sure, I have questions. A red dot, I think this is awful, we can't do this, please. Um, so the dots are great, they help us give a snapshot, um, but since you came out tonight and you're here, we would love you to give us comments. We have index cards, 
So you can sort of explain if you put a red dot, why did you hate it? If you put a green dot, why did you love it? Um, if you put a yellow dot, what's the information that we could get for you that would help you decide if this is a red or a green, if you're sort of on the fence? So ask questions of us, leave comments, um, that would be fantastic. Our next steps, so we will process the feedback from tonight, and our team is gonna work with municipal staff. Um, we'll continue to engage folks, um, and we will refine our preferred concepts. Um, another thing that you could do for us tonight is, you know, we've already met some people who own businesses in the area, who or might live in the area. If you know somebody that we really have to talk to who couldn't make it tonight, let us know, and we'll, find a way to reach out to that person. So we'll also add that to our process. That'll help us identify and refine a preferred concept. We're gonna develop new zoning language um, as part of this project and a final report that sort of illustrates what we think is the town's best opportunity for this site and zoning that could help get you there. That'll be the end of our project. At that point, the town will continue to advance things. The town, if the town is going to bring zoning forward, that of course would go through all the mandated planning board hearings and town meeting and all of those steps. So when the project is done, the work isn't done, um, but we're really gonna provide you with something that you can sort of, be, that'll be tangible and that you can bring forward, whether it's to write grants for more money or whether it's to bring zoning to town meeting, that'll be the product of this particular study. So with that, um, if there are any questions, Krista can bring a mic to you. And if there are no questions, you guys can come to the board. Or if you would rather just engage us directly because we'll be here, uh, we can do that. Uh, I have a question. Now, who owns the land that the post office is on now? That's, I do not know. That's, I do not know. Yeah. Okay, but the government doesn't own it, the federal government or anything don't. No. Good question. So I, it's technical about the, the soil condition. People get nervous and what it all means. We are doing the testing, it's underway. Uh, the, it was a DPW site for as long as we all can remember and longer. So there will be problems there, but I wonder if you could offer insight into what a potential you know, downsides to selling it as is, and if there's a less of a yield to the town in that sales, you know, for retail, for selling it outright? Well, certainly, you know, a developer does, you've all heard the word due diligence, the phrase due diligence, right? So the developer's gonna do the due diligence on this. And what's great is that the town is, is taking the investigations, proactive um, investigations on the site. So the town will be able to go to any perspective buyer and say, look, these are stamped official reports. We know what's there, we know what's required, and we know what it's gonna cost to get it from where it is today to where you want it tomorrow. So from a procedural point, that's all like exactly what you want. Um, in terms of how it affects the cost of the property, that will be a negotiated issue. So if there's a little bit of oil in the ground and some petroleum products, things that can be pretty easily sparged out. Um, that's certainly easier to deal with than if there are sort of nasty chemicals from batteries and whatnot. And again, the phase one indicates that that's not what we're gonna be finding there. But you know, just to give you a sense of sort of the difference. So that can play into the negotiation process and, and affect the price. Um, all four of the concepts mention repurposing the existing building, the barn. What ideas did you have about how that building is getting repurposed? Well, the, the idea is to keep the, the shell of the building as is. I mean, the building's beautiful. Um, my understanding, I have not been in the building. I sort of, I went to the window and I, I looked inside. Um, but my understanding is that the building needs some work. Um, so there's probably needs to be an investigation from um, an architect and a structural engineer before anything gets done. Um, but you know, from, from our perspective, what the building holds inside would be great. Our, our thinking is community um, purpose, um, but it, we ha 
if you have ideas, that's like the kind of feedback that we want to get um, from our vantage point, from our perspective, keeping the building is what's important um, to the degree that you can. And I think you, you'd be able to. It does need work, but it's a gorgeous structure. And, you know, reinvigorating it and, and occupying it with something that people can enjoy um, is sort of really the, the high level of philosophy there. But if people have ideas, we're all ears. So thinking about these four concepts, uh, on the one end, we're talking about with the eco-restoration open space project spending money, and on the far end, generating ongoing revenue to the town. So my question is, has anyone put any sort of ballpark cost on what it would take to do the open space eco-restoration on the one hand? And on the other end of the spectrum, what the value to the town in terms of on, you know, sale of property, ongoing revenue would be? No, there have been no numbers run. I mean, I think, and we can probably research some of that data. I mean, the, the cost for the restoration, we can definitely get a number for that because that's something that our firm does as part of our work. Um, so we can probably put a ballpark figure on that. I would probably think it's gonna be in the six you know, seven, I'm rather seven digit range um, to, to get that done. Um, but don't, you know, I will, don't quote me on that at home. Um, so, um, and we can also, you know, think about, I mean, the assessor has a value on this property, which I don't know off the top of my head, 214. Um, so the land value right now is valued at 214, but of course there's a lot of discussion that needs to happen in terms of what the concept's going to be, what the cleanup's going to be. Um, one of the great things about, have, again, the municipality having control um, is that if they really like, um, if they really think there's going to be a major long-term benefit in terms of something that this uh, a developer is proposing, you know, you get to play with the price of the property. So you could hold fast and try to get as much as you can for the property, or you see a particular proposal where in the long run I'm really going to get more for this so I can drop the price a little bit um, and negotiate. Um, but we can probably research, you know, again, how this has played out in a couple of other communities um, to get a sense of that. But I guess you're looking in the, around the 214 range right now. Have you ever thought of uh, doing like a teen center? A teen, something for the teens instead, like something totally different. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's not been brought up, um, but you know, those, that's the kind of feedback we're looking I just, for. I just think that, you know, all the people, you know, so many people come to Grafton because of the schools, because of the community. Mm -hmm. um, it's brought so many families, but there's not enough to do for the, for the kids, mm -hmm. for the teens. And I just thought, you know, a teen center would be like great. And that would give the kids a uh, job opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, something to, to work to. And, and that would be like a community for the kids. Yep to get involved in, in doing something more and maybe uh, add a, I don't know, something like a, a pool and spray pool near it too, which would bring some of the younger kids because the park, when I moved here 15 years ago, there used to be that wood park and everybody loved that wood park and now it's gone and there mm -hmm. really isn't anything. And I know you guys are supposed to build a super park. I don't know what happened. I didn't really know any details about that, but, um, I just think that if you added a park somehow or pool and thing and a teen center, mm -hmm. uh, focus more on the kids, the teens, or, or add a couple of different buildings, but uh, maybe some for commercial and for teens, that kind of idea. All right, well, I know it's like a fifth idea. We'll definitely it's look not at really it. On there. That's why we're here um, tonight, is to hear I what you think. I just think that you know, think. the kids are missing here. The, yep. the, the whole town for kids mm -hmm. more than housing and, and all these other things for something for them to do mm -hmm. so they don't have to go out other towns yep. out other places they can stay in Grafton right and that's an example again where um, because the town has control you can think creatively about the development program and you know maybe um, get having a teen center or having something that is 
public purpose, um, a, a true public amenity being built by a private party is important to you, and you work that out in the deal. You know, so it's a sort of community benefits uh, are, is how this is usually referred to in the development circles, and a developer may be willing to build space um, that is public as part of a larger private development if those numbers work. Hang on, hang on. You would probably create, um, you know, maybe with like the pool and the spray thing, like kind of like the Grafton Lake, you have to have like a residential uh, sticker or whatever, you have to buy it every summer. So you would purchase, they would have to purchase a residential uh, ticket or whatever to go to use the pool mm -hmm. and the spray and the whole thing as added revenue um, to make revenue in that way. Plus you'd have the teen center somehow making some revenue. Um, and then bringing it in as a community. You're getting way ahead down down into the into the programming. It's great. So if uh, one of the choices ends up uh, being the mixed use or residential, uh, and the town just sells this land to a developer, realistically, how much control after that? does the town have, I understand there's zoning and that sort of thing, but realistically, how much control does the town have about the final say of a project? And I think about when I lived back in Northboro and the guy bought the uh, old town hall mm -hmm. and it burned to the ground yeah. and uh, he was gonna replace it with some modern building. Um, I think about when I drive into Westboro on Route 30 and I look at that, I hope there's nobody here from Avidia Bank, but that horrendous, you know, uh, West German uh, style building on the right hand side of the road as you come in. So how much control does the town have once they've sold the property for development? So the, the first part of the part of that answer is how clear is the town's vision, right? So the, the more clarity you can get, the more clear you can be with the developer. From a legal standpoint, then, you mentioned zoning, of course, that's kind of your first front line of, of uh, control over how the building is going to be um, developed. And there's kind of two mechanisms that you can think of on top of that. So without you know, trying to get too geeky legal here, one is the, is the method of approval. So for example, if the town uses a special permit as the method of approval, state law gives the town the legal authority to bind the developer to a series of conditions that they can write at their discretion. So that series of conditions can represent the vision and all the important priorities, and if the developer does not abide by those, that is a violation, and then fined, and things get rebuilt, and, and all of that. That's one way to condition that. The other, is sort of a belt and suspenders approach is using things like a memoranda of agreement. So there are um, covenants that go into the development that are layered on top of the zoning. Um, the most famous example of this, of course, I, I hesitate to shudder to even say it because it's so different, but like the city of Houston, for example, doesn't have zoning by use. They do everything by covenant. Uh, but there are some, some more sort of applicable things where, for example, in northern Rhode Island, there was some industrial office park built. And really the meat of how that was designed and programmed and built was all done through uh, memoranda of agreements, which were layered on top of the zoning. So there are ways that you can really increase the amount of control that you have here. <clears throat> just one one point, just illustrative of the control we can have. This, we'll have to go through a public, public procurement process to sell it to a private developer. We'll put criteria in that that they'll have to meet, and the board will get to select the best proposal based on the vision that we kind of set here now. We're doing the same exact thing with 8 Pine Street near the train station through the sales partnership with the state of Massachusetts. So we have double bottom line as the criteria of you know, what we sell it for and then what's the highest and best use. So we have the flexibility that if there's a long-term impact for tax growth for us, but a low dollar value, we're gonna move forward because we think you know, building 200 rental units is more important than getting $2 million for the parcel. 
I'm not saying that's what will happen, but those are the things, the very variances we would look at to see what the best solution is. But we, we built that into the RFP for Eight Pine. We would build it into this one as well. Okay, you guys ready to do dots, stickers? Oh, Donna's got a question. Um, I think um, the idea of a youth center and recreation area is terrific. Could you make a space for number five on these boards, one of these boards, so people can put stickers on that as well? These stickers here, these post-its, can serve as your votes for a teen center, for a swimming pool, for a clam shack, whatever. But could you make a space? Do you want us to put like a box where people can put their dot? I do. We will number five, concept we'll, number five. We'll, we'll, we'll put a box. Great. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So um, for that, just so we're all aware, and so um, my, my colleagues are aware, one of you is gonna be in charge of drawing the box for the teen center voting. I would say that it would go at that concept four over there, like sort of down the bottom, put a box with teen center on top. Krista's got it. All right. So we'll be here. Um, engage with us, ask more questions, but please come up to the boards and Get your get your dots going.